really hope you got your running shoes on because in the next hour, we're going to cover all of the targeted therapies. We have five different speakers. Dr. Kipps is uh, going to be coming up. We're going to start with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jeff Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones is out of Ohio State. Um, and um, he is, is the hematology out of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he's affiliated with multiple hospitals in the area, the James Panzer Center, uh, the Solov uh, Research Institute at the Wexner Medical Center there, medical degree from the University of Michigan. Dr. Michael Choi, who's uh, here, specializes in uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and other blood disorders. He works with Dr. Kipps and Dr. Castro um, and has been developing and participating in research studies um, on uh, CLL. Um, he, he's a local guy with the University of Southern California um, near uh, uh, where I got my master's degree. He did his fellowship at the University of California in San Diego. Um, Dr. Weirda will be uh, finishing up, uh, and you've heard his name mentioned. He's a professor in the uh, center, a medical director uh, for leukemia at MD Anderson. Um, so he's visiting us from Houston. Um, he uh, got his PhD and MD at the University of Health Sciences, Chicago Medical School, postgraduate training in internal medicine at uh, Duke. And he worked here uh, with the team here and Dr. Kipps um, in San Diego. Um, in his areas of involvement are prognostic factors, uh, prognostic indicators, immune and gene therapies, um, working on the CAR T therapies, uh, new uh, chemo immunotherapies. Um, and uh, we're also having uh, Dr. Castro uh, speaking. So Dr. Castro has interesting um, background because Dr. Castro not only um, is an associate clinical professor in blood and uh, but also in bone marrow transplants. Uh, so he's got a foot in both areas dealing with the bone marrow transplants and the CLL. Uh, he likes to translate kind of what's going on in the lab and early therapeutic uh, uh, interventions in CLL also looking at uh, cellular stem cells, gene immunotherapy, and he's an active member of the CRC. So you're going to hear from all five of them, not particularly in that order, over the next hour. So, all right, running shoes on. So I always uh, appreciate when the biographical detail, um, being a professor at Ohio State, is that I went to medical school at the University of Michigan. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to take you on a very quick trip through um, the data guiding the use of kinase inhibitors in CLL. Many of you have participated in clinical trials looking around the room, you're familiar to me, and uh, may know some of this as well as I do. So I'll talk um, about some of the clinical results that are already well known um, briefly, and then talk about some of the newer things that we're thinking about as we're trying to integrate these agents into practice more broadly. <laughs> So we already heard that um, in CLL there are uh, features of this disease like Ebony cancer where the engine is running somewhat autonomously, the accelerator is stuck, and the cells are forgetting how to die, that the brakes have failed. And so we're going to hear later about drugs like BCL2 that help to inhibitors that help restore the brakes. But when we're talking about kinase inhibitors, we're really talking about drugs that try to disengage the accelerator from the engine. And that's as engineering as I get. So what is the accelerator of the CLL cell? Well, we know now that the primary driving force that sustains and, and um, tells the CLL cell to grow is the B-cell receptor. And the B-cell receptor leads to a whole cascade of signals. So instead of wires from the accelerator to the engine, these are just a series of protein kinases. Those are proteins that control growth processes in the body that ultimately lead the cell to grow, to interact with its environment so that it's protected and safe and lives longer. And so some of the ones that are more clinically meaningful as we talk about specific drugs are the PI3 kinase delta, that's the target of drugs like idelalicib or zidelic that's now approved. And then the BTK enzyme, the Brutin's tyrosine kinase, which is targeted by a number of drugs in development as well as the approved drug, ibrutinib. So kinases um, and their targets actually fit into one another like a lock into a key. And ordinarily, a kinase catalyzes or runs a process where it's very, very specific for its target. And drugs that are kinase inhibitors 
are meant to fit into that pocket like a key into a lock or a puzzle piece, locking its normal activity. And when those protein kinases in CLL cells are blocked, it leads to a whole host of biological effects that are observed when we take care of the patients. So we have already talked about how normal CLL cells interact with their environment. And when the signal to grow and to interact is inhibited by a drug like ibrutinib, or this could be any of the other drugs, then those cells are no longer um, moored into their protected environment inside the lymph nodes, and they're free to get back into the, into the blood. And that's something that we notice when we take care of patients receiving kinase, kinase inhibitor therapy. And then those cells don't go back to the lymph node. So the lymph nodes shrink, and the blood compartment of CLL cells can rise for a time. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. So this is a patient who was treated with the PI3 kinase delta inhibitor, idelalicid. And this patient, before treatment, had large bulky lymph nodes around her neck, but a relatively low lymphocyte count in her peripheral blood. But as she began treatment, her lymphocyte count rose, and her lymph nodes actually regressed quite dramatically. She, she, she found her neck again. And then over time, her lymphocyte counts gradually fell. And so this is an indication that um, by blocking the growth pathways from the B-cell receptor, we can have a clinically meaningful outcome for patients. So this is, this is what we would have, would have predicted. And so the results, which I'll just review very briefly, since um, they're well known to many of you, have been quite impressive. So this is for idelalicid, and this is a study that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine and was recently updated with longer follow-up of idelalicid and rituximab compared to rituximab alone. And you can see that idelalicid and rituximab resulted in an overall response rate of about 81% in relapse CLL as compared to only 13% of uh, two single agent rituximab. And what's very remarkable about this in, 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 uh, in looking at a larger group of CLL patients is that the patients at highest risk for having a bad outcome, all of the bad genetic features that you've heard about over the course of the morning, well, they did just as well. So the group with or without those abnormal features, well, if you looked at how many of the patients had progressed out at 24 months, or at 12 months, the group with and without the immunoglobulin heavy chain gene mutation or presence or absence of deletion 17P to just as well. So very remarkable for that. And if we look at how the patients did when they received these drugs in the front line, meaning before they had any other kind of therapy, you can see that the majority of patients actually achieve a response. So overwhelming majority, 97%, and of the relatively small number of deletion 17P patients, the patients at highest risk, 100% of them had achieved a response in this uh, relatively small study of only 64 patients. Probably the most remarkable thing with this drug, like ibrutinib, is that the responses are maintained. So if you look at the response now um, at a relatively early amount of follow-up of only 30 months, Almost all of the patients remained free of disease progression, 93%, by taking a flex daily oral medication after a brief course of rituximab. So very, very, um, very impressive. But as we heard about already, when we're comparing it to older chemotherapy regimens where the data goes for five, 10, in some cases, 20 years of follow-up, like the patients treated with FCR and MD Anderson, it's going to take us a while to know whether or not these results really are as, um, as viable as we, we were all hoping that they are. Looking at the data for abrutinib, something very similar holds. You can see that the overall response rate for abrutinib for relapse disease in the phase two study that was the primary, primarily the basis for the drug's approval, 90% of patients received a response, achieved a response. But probably the most important thing to notice here, and in the group of patients with previously untreated disease receiving ibrutinib as their first therapy, the majority of patients only achieve a partial response. That's the blue bar there. So unlike chemotherapy regimens, patients don't go into a complete remission ordinarily when they're receiving a kinase inhibitor therapy, at least not the majority of patients. But that said, 
when the patients are followed over time, their response, their clinical benefit, even if it isn't a complete response, is very well maintained. And that's an important thing for all of us as investigators and for patients to consider, is that this is a potentially a very different model for how we've approached the problem of CLL in the past. We thought we had to put patients into a very deep remission, and that that was the only way that they could be in sustained good health over time. Whereas now, it's possible, although controversial, we may be changing the model of how we treat CLL into one of chronic maintenance therapy with a well-tolerated drug. There are a group of patients, particularly the patients who were previously untreated, who can go into a complete remission, and that's what this is shown here. If you look at this curve here, that's the dark curve, oops, not over there in the camera, you can see that in the patients who received our group of this frontline therapy, some patients will ultimately achieve a complete remission. It's no higher than about 13% at 24 months of treatment, rising to as high as 23% at nearly four years of treatment. So it's a minority, and it happens gradually over time. But that is potentially a group of patients who may be able to discontinue therapy at some point in the future, which is another area of interest um, that we'll all have um, as our experience increases. Like uh, Adela Lissa, Ibrutinib results in very good results across the genetic risk groups of uh, patients with high, higher risk genetic disease with deletion 11Q and deletion 17P. But you can see that the good news doesn't, um, doesn't hold for all patients, that there are still a group of patients, even effective as Ibrutinib is, who cannot be sustained in remission over time with just Ibrutinib. And these are patients, many of whom have received five plus lines of therapy, and we're receiving ibrutinib as, um, as a drug of last resort. So their experience was remarkable, but it helps us know that perhaps ibrutinib earlier on in treatment may be, may be more beneficial for them. The other thing about considering whether or not a treatment is doable for the longer term is to understand whether it's tolerable. And here you can see the amount of severe toxicity that these patients experience. And it was relatively mild if you compare it to what's reported for most chemotherapy trials. And if you look at how the drug is tolerated over time, you can see that the frequency of these significant adverse events decreases with subsequent years on therapy. So this is a drug that is not so poorly tolerated that patients can take it for one year and then have to discontinue, but it's feasible for long-term administration, as many of you in the room can attest. So if patients do discontinue ibrutinib, or what, what's, what's, the, what's the reason? So we looked at our group of patients treated with ibrutinib at Ohio State, which at the time this analysis was done was about 300 patients treated across or uh, sequential clinical trials to see just what was happening. The most important thing for all of you who are taking a root nip or are considering taking a root nip to know is that the majority of patients do well. The patients who aren't doing well are fortunately the minority and that big red share of the pie um, should be a testament that in the first 300 patients, 220 five remained on study treatments at least 20 months beyond the time they began treatment, which is pretty remarkable for any drug. Uh, diuretics and high blood pressure pills don't do that well in the majority of cases, so, so doing very well. But there are a group of patients that are, are progressing. And the way patients have progressed are in two ways. One is that their CLL continues to grow, and then the other is that they've developed Richter transformation. And in our group of patients, it's been about half and half. Again, a rare event, but some of the patients have, have progressed. So what do we think is happening? Well, the first thing that's happening is that the BTK enzyme is changing. So now that key that should fit into the lock, well, the locks have been changed. And so now the agrutinib cannot fit into the BTK enzyme, and the drug is essentially useless. On the other hand, there are subsequent link in the chain. This is something, an enzyme called PLC gamma, usually relies on DTK to be turned on. But in other cases that we've observed, this PLC gamma is turned on and functions autonomously, which again makes BT, a BTK inhibitor ineffective treatment for the disease. 
If you look at the two groups of patients, the patients with progressive CLL have almost always had a mutation in our, in our look. So those patients have a known BTK or PLC gamma mutation that makes ibrutinib less effective than it once was. In the case of Richter's transformation, we haven't been able to find those mutations, and that's a group of patients that we're still trying to understand, both at OSU and throughout the CRC and other places where CLL is investigated, to understand the biological process that's causing that to happen. So just to, just to, to, to wrap up, we're often asked about the differences between ibrutinib and idelalicid because we're, we're blessed with having two highly effective drugs reach the market within about six months of one another last year. And the way we, we typically um, we think about it is that treatment success with any drug like a kinase inhibitor really depends on a patient being able to take it and to be able to take it religiously and long term. But the ability to keep to the program really depends. It depends on the patient and it depends on their clinical situation. So for some patients, ibrutinib is, um, is the better choice because they don't require blood thinners or they don't have an abnormal heart rhythm. And in other cases, there are patients for whom adelalicid is not the best choice because they have developed immune side effects of the drug, or at least we think they may be immune side effects, such as inflammation in the lungs, in the gut, and sometimes inflammation of the liver. And so, on balance, there are reasons that any individual patient in consultation with their doctor could consider one or the other drug to be appropriate. Although, in general, it does look like the responses to a group appear to be more sustainable over time. Should also tell you that because of the success of those two, two drugs, a number of other kinase inhibitors are in development, and each one of them may be a better ibrutinib or a better idelalicid because it's more specific, it's better tolerated, it's more potent, and these studies are um, ongoing at many of the centers in the, in the CRC and uh, are of interest to patients who um, may be considering taking a kinase inhibitor for the first time as an alternative to one of the licensed agents if you're highly motivated to participate in clinical research. It's also important to know that if you have not yet been treated for CLL, there are several ongoing studies that are designed to address definitively whether these newer therapies can truly replace chemotherapy. I think that's, that's our clinical impression that that may be the case but studies like these, one that compares frontline treatment with ibrutinib and rituximab to FCR for younger, healthier patients, and another study that compares ibrutinib and ibrutinib and rituximab to bendamustine and rituximab for patients who are over the age of 65. And those are accruing patients around the country. We're also interested um, around the world to understand whether early treatment with some of these drugs, since the responses are better and apparently better sustained, could be interesting. And this study from the German CLL study group is accruing patients in Europe, and we expect to, to open a study very similar to this in the United States um, in, the coming, in the coming year, where we'll take patients who are at highest risk of developing complications of CLL or dying from CLL, patients with high-risk genetic features, and seeing if early treatment with a drug like ibrutinib can change the course of their disease. So we're still trying to understand the role of the kinase inhibitors um, in their place in therapy, particularly in the front line, where they yet uh, have, a, have, a, have approval, yet to find approval here in the United States. And we're also interested to manage that group of patients who are at highest risk of relapsing while taking a kinase inhibitor. Those are the same group of patients who've always been at high risk for doing it poorly, and that's patients with deletion 17P and others. So some folks think that we'll need to add a drug from another class. Other people think we need to double down on, on that path from the accelerator to the engine and maybe block it at a number of points. So Dr. Kip said, throw a wrench into the machine, and maybe we need to throw a couple of wrenches into the same machine. Or maybe we need to restore the brakes at the same time we uh, disconnect the accelerator. Remains to be seen. And then finally, once we get out there to the three and four year mark for patients being successfully treated with ibrutinib, the patients who are in deep sustained remission, there's going to be interest to see whether we can stop therapy since it's expensive 
And I don't think there's anyone who takes a pill every day who wishes, wishes that they didn't. And those are some of the things that we'll uh, continue to think about in the coming years. Thank you for your attention.